Okay, hi everyone. Um, are there questions about the assignment that's due tomorrow? It's not. Okay, so um, I'm going to start talking about property, the, what Locke discusses in Chapter 5. Um, some of the things I didn't get to last time will, might come up later, but uh, I'm just going to start talking about the new materials. So, um, so Locke is actually famous for uh, defending or justifying property. Um, which he does, obviously, um, and he is – oh, someone is asking me a question about what are the prompts. Can you clarify this part when you get the chance? What kind of mistake do I make if I disobey the first law in the way it binds in foro interno? That is, if I do not desire what the, that the first law should be obeyed by everyone. Why, according to Hobbes, is that always eternally and immutably a mistake? Yeah, it's just asking, uh, um, so in a state of nature, Hobbes' laws of nature bind in foro interno. That means they require us to desire things. The first law requires us to desire that everyone seek peace or that there be peace. I'm not sure which way to understand that. I guess my question implies I desire everyone should seek peace. Um, probably comes to the same thing. Anyway, um, so the question is, uh, I mean, if a law binds, that means according to Hobbes, it's in your interest to follow the law, and if you don't, you've made a mistake and there'll be bad consequences. So the question is, what mistake have you made in the state of nature if you don't desire that everyone seek peace? Um, what will be the bad consequences? What, or in other words, what it's asked at the end is why, according to Hobbes, is that always a mistake, no matter what your circumstances, state of nature, or civil state, whatever, not to desire that. Um, yeah, it may be, I'm a little worried that this question, you know, Oh, no commonwealth. Yeah, in a state of nature, there's no commonwealth. In a commonwealth, this law binds in foro externo, right? That is, you're required to be peaceful, <laughs> um, to act peacefully in a commonwealth, um, to act so as to maintain the peace. But uh, the question is, even if there is no commonwealth, why? Because remember, law, Hobbes says, the laws of nature bind always and everywhere, not, however, always in foro externo. So in a state of nature, they bind only in foro interno. That is, they bind you only to desire things. But that means that even in a state of nature, if you don't desire that, you've um, made a mistake. You've done something against your own best interest. Okay. Well, as I was about to say, you know, like, um, if you find you can answer one of these questions and it doesn't take up the whole space, which I think might happen with this one, you know, don't worry about it too much if it's a good answer. I'm not, and I'm not going to tell Donovan to, like, obsess about how long the paper is. It's, that's, it's more just a guideline so you know what kind of paper I'm asking for here. You know, a short paper, um, if it's a little bit longer. I mean, look, we all know that you can change the length of the paper by just, like, changing the 
spacing between the characters and the words a little bit. You can make it, well, I, you know, if I were really obsessed, I would ask for a number of words, not for a number of pages. Okay, are there other questions about that? Yes. Sorry, just a quick one. I'm doing the first prompt, and it's about hogs and animals, and I was wondering, I'm having difficulty finding him speaking directly about what he believes an animal to be. I see, like, in the way... Okay, here's my question. I see in ways that he says a commonwealth is like an animal or a living being, and that this part operates in this way, and this part operates in this way, like the well, like strength the nerves, etc. Yeah. But yeah. I'm having trouble finding like I guess this part of the prompt. In what way is a commonwealth like a natural animal? Like are those the ways that it's like a natural animal? They're like nerves are this, this is this. Well I think he says uh, right towards the beginning of the introduction what it is to be alive, by which he doesn't seem not clearly including plants, but it obviously includes all animals. Um, okay. Right? It has the source of motion in some principal part within or something like that. Yeah, I, I have that part yeah. of, I guess. So I was... he does say. Cool, so yep. I, okay. Okay. I got that part. Thanks, sorry. Okay, um, all right, sorry, back to Locke and property. So he does defend property, or, uh, and, um, and he is defending it against someone. Um, that is, there were people in this time who denied that there sh was or should be such a thing as private property. Certain radical Protestant groups were communists in the literal sense of like thinking that all good should be in common to all the believers. Um, so, uh, um, so it's not as if he's in a position where literally everyone agrees there should be property and there's no one to defend it against. However, uh, I don't think that defending against literal communists is his main concern here. Um, you know, I think by the end of the English Civil War, those people were pretty much uh, not around very much in England. Um, they were kind of stamped out in the continent even earlier, I guess, in the German Peasants' War or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, I don't think that's his main worry here. I think he's mostly arguing with other people, which is almost everyone who agrees that, of course, there's such a thing as property rights. But the question is, where do those rights come from? Right? And we'll see uh, coming up that even Rousseau, when... I guess like in the mood where he attacks or says bad things about private property. Um, even Rousseau, when he says that, takes it for granted that he's attacking civilization as such. Right? In other words, um, most Rousseau agrees with all these people that, you know, uh, civilized life at least is unthinkable without private property rights. Um, so, um, um, so who is Locke arguing with? Well, of course, as usual, the person he's most explicitly arguing with is Filmer. Um, and that's why he starts out by arguing and quoting Hooker, who's his, like, theological authority. They seem to be kind of like half frozen here, but I'm moving now. All right. Um, right, I mean, you have to understand, like, when Locke quotes the Bible or when he quotes Hooker, um, he's trying to, he's trying to show that, uh, religion is on the side of reason. Right. I mean, he's I, I don't think there's ever a place where he quotes the Bible where he doesn't also give you an argument or at least imply that he has an argument. 
right? Say reason and revelation both yield, right? There's there's never a place like that. And uh, I mean, I'm not, I don't think that Hooker does that in this section of his book either, for that matter. Um, so it's not like an independent proof of something. It's like showing, and if, by the way, you're going to accuse me of being against religion with my fancy reason and everything, I'm going to show you that no, orthodox religion is on my side. The Bible agrees with me. Hooker agrees with me. Right. So anyway, so, so Locke starts by... Um, arguing and quoting Hooker to the effect that the natural things originally or naturally belong to everyone in common. And he's arguing that, right? He tries to prove it. He's not conceding it, right? If you were arguing with communists, he would the, the situation would be like, okay, I admit, and to begin with, they were all in common, but now they're not. But he's actually arguing with Filmer According to Filmer, they were never all in common. God gave them all to Adam. Right? So that's why Locke has to start off by proving that, no, to begin with, they were all in common. Um, and then moving on from there to, to defend the position that, um, that is to defend the position that originally all things were in common against the accusation that this would make property rights impossible. Um, so, I mean, as usual, however, that's not that interesting because Filler's position is not that attractive. <laughs> um, and it's more, and, and Locke's doctrine on property is distinctive to him and it is important and there is an important disagreement with Hobbes in it. So I'm going to try to explain what that is. Um, but you have to start, first of all, by asking what Locke means by property. And the answer is, um, and Locke and Hobbes agree about this, I think. Property is... Exclusive right. Um, that is um, primarily, or in the first place, property is a kind of right. It's not a thing. Um, so, um, uh, you know, if I say this eraser is my property, the property is actually my right to use this eraser without interference by anyone else. Um, so in other words, property is basically a limitation of other people's rights. This is the same picture I drew last time, right? Like property means within a certain sphere, I have the right to um, do things or use things um, so, I mean, that is, I'm drawing this as a, like a place. So, why does, why is this getting so slow? Perfect. You said, um, limitations, properties, limitations of other people's rights, correct? Yeah. It, it means that, um, it means that my rights within this sphere are proper to me. Right? Proper comes from the Latin word for, like, self, right? Your, your property is what's proper to you, is what, is what pertains to you and not anyone else. So the rights within this sphere, and, you know, uh, this, might, this doesn't have to be a literal spatial sphere because the point I'm making is that property doesn't have to, be, uh, doesn't have to involve a thing at all. Right, that is under this definition of property that I think Hobbes and Locke both share. Um, um, my right to do things is part of my property. So if there's actions that I have a right to do and no one has a right to interfere with me, to, to impede me from doing them, then that also is part of my property. 
So with that definition, of course, you can see right away why, according to Hobbes, there can be no property in the state of nature, whereas according to Locke, there can. Right? According to Hobbes, in a state of nature, there is no sphere like that. Of course, I have lots of rights in the state of nature. I have infinite rights, according to Hobbes. But everyone else also has infinite rights, so there's no sphere of rights that are exclusive to me where I can say, I'm, I can do this or use this object and no one else can interfere with me. Um, whereas, again, to, draw, to finish drawing the picture from last time, according to Locke, even in a state of nature, there are, so to speak, invisible chains on everyone else, keeping them out of my sphere. So that's why, according to Locke, even in a state of nature, there can be property. Um, now, for the same reason, once the Commonwealth is formed, Locke and Hobbes are going to disagree about the possibility of property against the government, against the sovereign. I mean, this is basically just, uh, as you can see from the fact that it's the same picture, it's the exact same thing I was saying before, last time, about um, the fact that, according to Locke, even within the Commonwealth, you have um, rights against the sovereign. I have um, a quick question before yes. you continue, before I get lost. Um, yes. Are you saying that Hobbes and Locke both believe that there is such a thing as exclusive right, but they, they differ in where they believe this exclusive right takes place? Um, yes, although now that you put it that way, maybe I shouldn't have quite said that, right? Because, of course, Hobbes doesn't believe that there's ever exclusive right in the sense that you ever have a right against the sovereign. That's what I'm about to talk about, actually. Right? So, according to Hobbes, according to Locke, there's this sphere that's mine even within the state of nature. I enter into the Commonwealth, right? The people who form the Commonwealth um, make a convention with each other on the basis that they already have property. They enter the Commonwealth with property. They don't give it all up, so they still have some. And um, the Commonwealth, via the sovereign, or I mean, we'll see, it's like it's more complicated in luck. There's a legislative power and an executive power. But anyway, the, the Commonwealth, via its uh, organs of government, um, have no right against the property that I came into the covenant with and never gave up. Um, saying that first when you said this is the one thing that Hobbes and Locke agree on? Oh, what I was saying they agree on is just that this is what property means. I think that's what I said. Oh, okay. Thank you. Right. In other words, uh, that is, for in both cases, it's important. I mean, they both sometimes use property in a narrow sense, where property means things that I have an exclusive right to, the way we usually use the word property, right? But, um, but they both, a lot of the times, and they both explicitly define it in such a way that it's not limited to that. So it's important to pay attention to that. And it will be especially important to pay attention to that in a second when we get to see what Locke says we have property to in this uh, property in, in the state of nature and why. Okay, but before that, I just wanted to say, so, um, so this means that, you know, um, There's some truth to the idea that, or, well, I mean, there, there is true, it is true that Locke is in a sense, as opposed to Hobbes, is like the father of liberalism about property. Um, right? That is, Locke says that, you know, property is something that human beings can naturally have. And whatever commonwealth they set up to set up doesn't have any absolute power over it. 
So, of course, he agrees with Hobbes that the commonwealth has to be able to tax somehow. But he says, yes, but in order to levy a tax, they have to call on representatives of the people. Right? So, in other words, he's, he's uh, like, defending the English government doctrine, the one that Hobbes says is a dangerous mistake, that only Parliament can levy taxes, not the king. Um, okay, I mean, we'll talk about that more when we get to his explicit discussion of that. But, but, so, but in any case, Hobbes says the Commonwealth has no right to my property without representation, of course, or without due process of law, as we say, right? Because the Commonwealth can take my property as a punishment. Um, all right, but as opposed to Hobbes, who, although he's definitely not a communist, Right? That is, he doesn't think that all property is in common, um, not in a state of nature, because in a state of nature, uh, everyone has property individually, ha you know, has, so to speak, the right to everything. It's not, proper, it's not proper to them. It's not property. But everyone has the right to everything, as opposed to everyone having to share everything in common. So uh, there's... He doesn't, he's not a communist about the state of nature, but in the Commonwealth also, he thinks that um, one of the functions of the Commonwealth is to distribute powers and goods to the different subjects. Um, and that's the origin of property. And therefore, he, as I said before, he's really, uh, you know, even though he certainly contemplates free market institutions, he's really technically a socialist, right? He thinks that all property derives from the commonwealth and the, the sovereign has absolute authority to redistribute it in any way. I mean, at least it seems like that's what he thinks. There's something weird that I never got to talk about, about the 13th law of nature, and I'm certainly not going to go into it now, but like whether somehow it binds the sovereign in some way. Um, but in any case, as far as I can tell, that's that, so, so that's an important difference, right? And that's a sense in which you can say, and some people like Locke for this reason, and other people dislike Locke for this reason, depending on what their politics are, a sense in which you can say, yeah, Locke is the one who's defining, who's, who's um, defending our notion of private property rights. Okay, like I said, there'll be more to say about that when we get to the foundation of the Commonwealth. Right now, back to the state of nature. Um, so in the state of nature, what kind of thing could I possibly have property in? Well, um, because remember, Locke starts off by arguing against Filmer that... Um, Morrow says, seems like when a house goes foreclosed and the bank or the government can repossess the house to resell it. Well, not the government, unless the government is the lender. The bank can resell it because the house was, you know, uh, security against the loan. That was part of, that was a contract you made. Um, I mean, there, you know, there are certain other questions you could bring up about the government's right to well, there's actually a lot of questions, and most of them are live political questions, right? Like, what's the difference between taking my property as a punishment and taking it as a tax? You know, the Supreme Court decision about Obamacare uh, turned on that exact fact or exact question, right? They said, actually, oh, the government doesn't have a right to the Congress doesn't have a right to impose a fine for not buying health care, but we're going to say it's okay because at least this was John Roberts' position because I'm going to say it was a tax, <laughs> and Congress does have the right to pass a tax. <laughs> All right, so um, 
Um, right. And similarly, there's all kinds of, you know, what if the government has to make rules for public peace and safety, like let's say environmental regulations that result in my property being diminished or less valuable? So, I mean, but that's, that's a real issue, right? Uh, it's not surprising that Locke's account leaves that hard to decide because it really is a little hard to decide. Um, Okay, so Samantha says, if the origin of property in a commonwealth is when the sovereign distributes it, what is the origin of property in a state of nature? Well, okay, no, be careful. According to Hobbes, the origin of property in a commonwealth is when the sovereign distributes it. According to Locke, that's not the case. Like I said, according to Locke, people come into the commonwealth with property that they got in the state of nature. Then they make a compact that allows, you know, new positive laws to regulate sale and transfer of property and stuff like that. But um, that's not the origin of property. And therefore, it's not part of the Commonwealth's power to just arbitrarily redistribute property. Okay. Um, sorry, so what I was going to say. Right. So Locke has to explain, though, Assuming we started with all everything in common, how can it? How did this these exclusive rights originate to begin with? So the key to that, this is why I was emphasizing that what goes inside this sphere is not necessarily things. Um, and um, what goes into it to begin with in the state of nature, according to Locke, is not a thing at all. It's my personal liberty to do or forbear. Right? Remember that, you know, that's something that Locke started off defending or taking for granted maybe about the state of nature. Anyway, then in the state of nature, everyone has perfect liberty within the limitations of the law of nature. So in the state of nature, as long as I obey the law of nature, no one has a right to interfere with what I'm doing. No one has a right to put chains on me or whatever. Um, Right, so if you look on page 274, oh, it's not page 274. I'm doing the same thing I did before. And I meant to go back and change the page references in my notes, but I didn't have time. So it's chapter 4, section, no, that can't be. Chapter, oh yeah, chapter 4, section 27. No, chapter 5, section 27. I'm sorry. Fortunately, I can't really make that mistake because since the sections are numbered throughout, there is no chapter 4, section 27. Though the earth and all inferior creatures... Right? By inferior creatures, he means everything that was created by God that's inferior to human beings. Um, Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. So... Um, so the origin of property, according to Locke, is my personal physical right to physical liberty in the state of nature. Um, so the only question is how to get, so uh, maybe I should write, So the first kind of property is personal liberty. Mm. 
And the question is how to get from that um, to property in the narrow sense of rightful possessions, right? Things that I, with right, so to speak, hold on to, but, but the whole point is I don't literally have to hold on to them. Um, right? Remember, Hobbes says, in a state of nature, no one has any property except what they can get, as long as they can hold on to it. Right. But um, which is not really property at all. Property means that, you know, I have things that I possess that, so to speak, the law builds a fence around to keep everyone else out. I mean, as Hobbes points out, I may not trust the law that much. I may actually build a real fence, too. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but at least in theory, you know, uh, what's supposed to keep other people from taking my stuff is the law. So in the state of nature, that would be the law of nature. The law of nature is supposed to attach chains to everyone else to restrict them and keep them away from my stuff. So, so that kind of stuff that I have an exclusive right to is property in the narrow sense, what we usually call by property. And the question is, how do we get from this to that? So in order to do this, there has to be some kind of act, something I can do, right? Because this is all, this is all about things I can do, about actions I can perform. So there has to be some kind of action I can perform, which is my property in the sense that I have, am naturally at liberty to do it. So it doesn't violate the law of nature. And somehow, by way of that action, some kind of thing has to become proper to me. That's the only way I can get from this to, to you know, I guess I'll say like possessions. No, he has two S's both times. I'm a terrible speller. Uh, okay. So, um, So what is that act? So according to, act, to Locke, that act is labor. Right? The thing I can do that I'm at liberty to do, but once I do it, some... Sorry, I may, I, I'm using thing in a wide sense and then in a narrow sense, but like the action I can perform that I'm at liberty to perform... But once I finish performing it, something becomes proper to me is labor. And um, this, first of all, as Locke explains it, I think um, it's not in contradiction to the idea that God gave everything to all human beings in common because labor actually makes a new thing. So it wasn't, it's not part of what was given in common. And the new thing, right? So here's like the, you know, big thing. That's an acorn. So here's the acorn, and now I do something to it. And I make, you know, acorn fly. <laughs> I should draw one of those little uh, Minecraft piles of powder or something. But anyway, so I make this kind of like acorn flower out of the acorn. So acorn flower is, doesn't occur in nature. It's my thing that I made. Now, of course, it has in it, so to speak, as an ingredient, the original acorn. 
But um, Locke says, you can think of it this way, that it's like a mixture of the original acorn and my labor. I don't know how to draw that, but it's like, in other words, rather than look at it this way, you can look at it this way. That the acorn plus my labor mixed together to make this, this new thing, which is acorn flour. And um, of course, there is no way of now separating them back out and giving me back my labor and taking the acorn. They're inextricably linked or mixed. Um, right, so um, that's how Locke explains it going on in section 27 here. By the way, this is really on page 19 in this edition. Um, it being I, by, yes. I just wanted to reiterate. So when you said personal liberty, yeah. um, Locke is talking about the ability to engage in labor, like apart from maybe all the other things personal liberty might mean. Right. Well, in other words, by, by what I meant by personal liberty, I, I mean, that's uh, Locke, I guess, doesn't use that phrase exactly. But what I meant by it was, you know, the my original right to do what I want to in the state of nature, as long as it doesn't infringe on other people's rights or otherwise violate the law of nature. That's what I meant by personal liberty. So it's a liberty to, like, do stuff, including if I want pound on acorns with a stone right like that doesn't violate any law of nature to pound on the acorn with a stone um, okay so personal liberty also you said as long you can engage in anything as long as it's not infringing on anyone else's rights well I mean as long as I mean, which means the same thing as as long as it's not violating the law of nature. That's what Locke literally says, right? Freedom to do it, whatever you want within the limitations of the law of nature. But the law of nature will prevent me from taking someone else's life, liberty, or property. So, um, so I mean, to begin with, what we all, the only property we have is liberty to begin, so to speak. So those fall together and originally in the state of nature I can do anything that doesn't imprison someone else. Okay, gotcha, right? thank you. It doesn't like prevent them from acting. Then as soon as we start to do stuff like that people acquire more rights. Um, right, this, but it's by the same law of nature acting, it's just acting in a new situation. Now once I've pounded on the acorn and made it into flour, now all of a sudden you can do anything except imprison me or take my flour. <laughs> you can't take my flour because now it's mine, right? And I was trying, and I was, again, going back to the quote from Locke, I was trying to explain how Locke justifies that, right? He says, um, it being removed, that is, for example, the flower, right, being removed. By the way, you understand I mean flower like the flower you make bread out of, right? Not like a... I just realized that picture could look like a like the kind of flower you smell, you know? <laughs> it's like a it's like powdered acorn, right? So, um, um, so... It being by him removed from the common state nature hath placed it in, it hath by this labor something annexed to it that excludes the common right of other men. For this labor being the unquestionable property of the laborer, no man but he can have a right to that to what that is once joined to. He adds something else which is interesting, but um, 
I don't know if I'm going to get to talk about, or at least where there is enough and as good left in common for others, right? I mean, if there was only one acorn in the world, you know, maybe I wouldn't have this right. I guess I will say something about that. Locke emphasizes that in the original state of nature, there were very few people and there was lots of world, right? So that little qualification, as long as there is enough left for everyone else, didn't really limit anyone. Because, you know, whatever I could take, there was tons more of that. All you had to do is just go down, you know, to the next part of the forest. Um, so, uh, um, that thing about the original state of nature being sparsely populated seems to play an important role for him. But, of course, it's weird because um, like Hobbes, he's going to want to say that it's not just like long ago cavemen who were in the state of nature or people in parts of North America at this day, I mean, that is at his day, right? It's, but for example, you know, uh, commonwealths are in a state of nature with respect to each other. But that state of nature is different because it's a state of nature that, you know, is not sparsely populated. Commonwealths take up a lot of the space. <laughs> So anyway, so that so that might come in in certain ways, but I'm going to gloss over it for now and just say, um, right, the idea is I have every right to do what I want to this acorn. I mean, there's also a complication about that, which is going to come up a different version of it. It's going to be important in a second. It's not true that I have a right to like destroy the acorn, acorn for no good reason. You know, just like uh, throw it in the fire or something. Um, uh, remember, Locke said that I don't have so much as the right to destroy any creature unless it's for some nobler use. So the fact that I have a right to pound this acorn with a stone is because I have some use for doing that. I mean, the use could be pretty broadly defined, right? Like things that I like seeing or whatever. Maybe throwing the acorn in the fire would have a use if I think it's cool to see acorns explode in the fire. <laughs> but if I'm just doing it to destroy acorns, then the law of nature would forbid it. Um, yes, Griffin. Yeah, I just wanted to ask kind of how it would work if something was transferred uh, in terms of like a possession, if you transfer it through inheritance, does it still count as the person who you gave it to because you put the labor into making it your possession? Yes, part of, uh, I, I, I think it's true that there isn't exactly an independent account of why this is, but, de but Locke definitely assumes from the get-go that part of the right I acquire to something by mixing my labor with it is the right to give it to someone else. So that's not limited to inheritance, of course. But inheritance is just a special case of that, meaning that I give it to them, you know, right before I die or whatever. Um, um, right, and then other people still don't have a right to mess with it because it still, so to speak, contains my labor. <laughs> now, um, of course, that obviously that's a metaphor, right? Like, again, just like rights can't literally be laid down or transferred. I don't literally mix the acorn with some kind of stuff called labor um, that... You know, I mean, if you imagine that I had something, you know, like uh, baking powder that somehow became my property in the state of nature, never mind how, and then I mixed that with the acorn and there was no way to separate them, then the whole mixture would become my property. But labor is not like that, literally. Uh, so what does this metaphor mean? I think it means something like 
that, and I guess this probably throws light on the gift case as well. It means something like that the right to do stuff without interference must include the right to benefit from the result of what I do, or else it's meaningless. Right? That is, if you, if you say, you know, I have a right to do it if I want without anyone else's interference, but uh, every time I do something, you know, every time I pick someone's, something up, someone knocks it out of my hand, then I don't really have the liberty to pick things up. I th you know, and, and the simplest case of labor here, the one that Locke actually discusses, is much simpler than this. It's not grinding up the acorn. All I do is there's acorns scattered everywhere, and I gather them together into a pile. But, you know, in that case, I think you can see more clearly why, like, the right to pile up acorns must include the right to keep other people from knocking the pile over again, or else I don't really have a right to pile up acorns. And so, you know, like, sure enough, for uh, uh, Hobbes, um, I don't have that right, basically. Like, in a state of nature, I can try to pile up acorns if I want, but there's no guarantee they'll stay piled. It's a war of all against all. Um, so Alvaro says, is there a level of labor needed to make the acorn mine? If so, if I found the acorn on the floor without putting any labor into it, does that still make the acorn mine? Yeah, that's a good question. Where to draw the line here exactly? Like, suppose you just saw it or something. I saw it first, it's my acorn, right? Um, presumably that doesn't count as labor, but um, Locke doesn't go into the details. Um, I mean, it's probably not important for him to draw, be able to draw that line really sharply. After all, he's not literally, I mean, maybe, well, maybe it, though it is kind of important that people could draw it sharply if they had to in order to explain the origin of property and government. Excuse me, Professor? Yes. Does he answer that in section 28 where he says, if the first gathering made them not his, nothing else could? Yeah, but the question is, does it even require a gathering? I think is Alvaro's question. Like, what if all I did was, you know, pick up the leaf that the acorn was under? I didn't touch the acorn. Is it already mine? What if all I did was saw a particularly good acorn that no one else noticed? Is that mine? You know, is that kind of like, is that labor? Right? I mean, I did something. So, um, I mean, it, it does seem like um, kind of like picking them up, like manipulating with my body is part of what Locke is thinking is necessary here, but it's not clear why that should be the, the dividing line. I, you know, why do you have to touch it or move it? Um, but, um, yeah, so it's a good question, and I'm not sure exactly. I mean, I think, I was starting to say, I think Locke could say, well, it doesn't matter that much. It's not, I mean, we're not still in the state of nature. In a commonwealth, positive laws help us to draw lines in difficult cases. Um, in the state of nature... I think, you know, I mean, he would say this is part of what's inconvenient about a state of nature. You can't be sure that other people will interpret the law of nature the same way you do. But I'll talk about that more next time when I talk about why, according to Locke, we want to leave the state of nature and form a commonwealth, even though it's not the case that the state of nature is the worst possible state and is a war of all against all. Nevertheless, it's defective in certain ways. So I'll talk about that more next time. Um, so, um, right, so, and I think you can see uh, as a kind of continuation of that, that, like, I would also be able, you know, um, that part of what gives me a meaningful liberty to do things is not just to personally benefit the results, but to use them for someone else's benefit if I want. Um, uh, 
Um, and so, you know, therefore, all of that is part of what reason dictates we should defend for each other in a, in a state of nature. So if we're, in, if we're in a state of nature and you pick up some acorns and pile them up and someone else comes along and knocks your pile over and starts taking them away, so the idea then is that everyone around is going to say, oh no, we shouldn't allow that to happen. This is one of the rights we should defend. And then everyone taking up the executive power that is in each person in the state of nature will all gang up on the acorn robber and um, punish them um, and also help you get um, repaid right so they punish them for deterrence um, enough that it won't be worth their while to do it in the future if, if they're going to get punished that way and also make sure that you get your acorns back or something of equal value um, right, so that's how Locke gets um, property in a state of nature. Um, And notice again why this won't work for Hobbes. I think I've said it several times, but I'll say it again. It won't work for Hobbes because according to Hobbes, I don't have this. <laughs> according to Hobbes, in the state of nature, people have the right to do whatever they want with me and to impede me from whatever they want to impede me from doing, including to kill me if it's useful for them. And even if it's not useful for them, they're the sole judge of what's useful for them, similar to what he says about the sovereign, right? So according to Hobbes, everyone in the state of nature has the right to do whatever they think best for their own self-preservation. So if I think the best thing is to kill you, then I have the right. And therefore, you know, you don't start off with any original property that you could then use to start accumulating anything else. Okay, are there questions about that before I go on? Okay, so however, and this is related to what I was saying before about the right to destroy the acorn, according to Locke, there's an important limitation to my right to acquire possessions, property and possessions in this way in the state of nature. Um, and the limitation is chapter five, section 31. Um, it's on page 20. Um, let's see here at the bottom. The same law of nature that, by, that, that does by this means give us property does also bound that property too. God has given us all things richly. This is an example of what I was talking about. Is the voice of reason confirmed by inspiration? Right? So he's not saying... You have to accept this because it says it in the Bible. He's saying you have to accept this because it's the voice of reason. And by the way, the Bible agrees. <laughs> um, but how far has he given it us? To enjoy. So that's the end of the verse, but there must be a justification of this from reason as well. As much as anyone can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils, so much he may by his labor fix a property in. Whatever is beyond this is more than his share. So, um, right, so this is actually a pretty important limitation, 
this says that um, um, if I start using my labor to ground, grind acorns into flour, I'm making more and more and more flour. As soon as I make more flour than I can use before it spoils, I've made too much. I took more acorns than were my share. Well, actually, the way I just said it, and this is, I'm going to emphasize this because this is a tempting misunderstanding. What I just said is a little bit wrong. I don't violate the law of nature as soon as I make more flour than I can use before it spoils. I violate the law of nature when the flour actually spoils in my possession. Right? So if I make, I don't know how, I don't know how long it takes acorn flour to spoil. <laughs> But suppose it takes like a year to spoil <laughs> and suppose I make, I work really hard and I make enough acorn power, uh, flour for me to live on for two years. So far there's no violation of the law of nature, but at the end of the year when half my acorn flour spoils, at that point I violated the law of nature. Um... So that's important because what that means is remembering my um, right to give the flower to someone as a gift. There's actually a perfectly legal way I can make as much acorn flower as I want. I just have to make sure to give it all away before it spoils. I suppose the person who gets it as a gift doesn't in turn violate the law of nature if it spoils with them, which might be a weird kind of loophole here. Um, I mean, you might even imagine some people going into partnership and well, why would you do this? There would be no point to it. <laughs> right. So, um, but anyway, um, so, um, so that's the limitation. I can't keep stuff until it spoils. Now, um, what does that mean exactly that I can't keep it? And how do we know that the law of nature forbids this? Um, so, um, so again, although he quotes the Bible to this purpose as well, um, there must be a lot of reason behind it. And, um, the, the law of reason behind it must have something to do with, um, Back to this. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy. Um, how are we supposed to know that? Or what does that mean? Um, I think it means something like, insofar as we regard God as the executive in the law of nature, and this is one of the places in the essay where maybe he's implying that we could, um, that's because we think that evidently God has the interests of the whole species of humans in, in mind, not of any individual above any other. So, um, 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 if God has the best interests of all humans put together in mind, then, of course, um, uh, for someone to destroy something that other people could, in principle, use would be against the law that God evidently wants to see observed. Um, and... Um, um, all this, you know, would then supposedly be what Locke of the essay would say anyone, if they thought about it hard enough, could derive by reason. That is, they could prove the existence of God, they could prove, you know, somehow, I guess empirically, that God wants our species to be preserved, 
um, and so on and so forth. Um, or maybe it's not empirical, because after all, it has to be applied to all rational beings, really, including the rational parrot. And we'll have to go somehow through the idea that, that an infinitely powerful being can't be malicious, which is a strange point in Descartes as well, how you prove that. In any case, I'm not going to go too much into that because I think that in the essay, it's usually people in general who enforce the law of nature rather than God. Um, so, and that's something that much more clearly is something that you could get at by reason, what you can expect other people to approve of or disapprove of. Well, it's clear that people in general have the common interest in mind rather than the interest, rather than your particular interest. So, well, is that clear? I mean, unfortunately, that's not necessarily always true. Sometimes when people get together and make a decision in common, right? Like if you ask all the fishermen to get together and decide whether there should be limits on fishing, they'll decide no, <laughs> even though it's against their common interest. Right. So, but anyway, uh, but at least if people are reasonable, then, the, then, you know, what they'll all decide on together is that you shouldn't destroy things that other people could use. That actually was, you know, in effect as one of Hobbes's law of nature too, right? Remember, he said that it was against the law of nature to take stuff that you didn't need and other people did. Um, I guess you could say, well, how long do you have to keep it before you count as having taken it? And Locke says, until it spoils. <laughs> then they're never going to get it back, and that's the point at which you violated the law of nature. Okay, so... Um, so that sort of serves to define to defend that limitation. I, I haven't written anything about this in the whiteboard, which makes me nervous. There should be something written, right? Um, but I don't know what to write. Um, no more than I can use. That's the limitation. No more that I can use, that is, before it spoils. So, um, so we have kind of a defense for this limitation in saying, well, you know, you don't have a right to just ruin things. But if you think about the case of the acorns again, it, there's actually something a little weird about that. I mean, after all, the acorns are going to spoil anyway, right? I mean, if I don't gather them into a pile and I just leave them in the forest, they're going to spoil in the same amount of time they would have in my pile. So I'm not literally destroying them by piling them up until they spoil. They're not, spo they're not being destroyed any faster than they would anyway. Um, so the key here, again, is that I violated the law of nature if the things spoil in my possession. Where in my possession means in my lawful possession, that is, in a state where the law excludes other people from using it. So if I leave them out scattered on the floor, they'll eventually spoil. But I didn't do anything to keep other people from taking them before they're spoiled. So it's, you know, not my fault any more than it is anyone else's, right? There'd be no call to punish me for not having picked them up. You could have picked them up. So, um, but once I've gathered them together, because the law of nature gives me a property right in them, Right? And that's why when he explained this, Locke said um, the same... Uh, oh, I don't think I have that written down here. Oops. I need a better table. Um, the 
The same law of nature that does by this means give us property does also bound that property too. The law in keeping everyone else away from my acorns gives me the responsibility of making sure they don't spoil while that's the case. Because now other people, it's as if like they've already spoiled for everyone else, so to speak. So if I let them spoil, it's like I destroyed them myself. Right? There's, I, I destroyed them for everyone else when I gathered them in a place where the law is going to protect them from everyone else. And now if I let them rot, I've destroyed them. I've like finished destroying them, basically. Um, um, so in particular, um, you know, the, the, the limitation on how much I can engross, as Locke puts it, is um, um, is due to the fact that I can't say what Hobbes will tell you you can say in the law of na in the state of nature, which is that yes, I had a use for these acorns. My use was to keep them away from my potential enemies. <laughs> Right? It is, according to Hobbes, it wouldn't be spoiling, letting the acorn spoil. If I gather them up, if I eat all I can and burn the rest, right? It's like, you know, uh, the way a uh, um, uh, state might, like, burn its crops bef before the invader can can come in so that they won't be able to feed their army. Right? Like, it's not just wanton destruction. Um, I'm doing it out of the desire for self preservation. So, um, uh, but as soon as the law protects my acorns from everyone else, I don't have that plea. I have to content myself with what I can. Um, use assuming everyone else is law-abiding. So again, it's the same law that provides me protection that also limits how much I'm allowed to accumulate. Now, uh, okay, so there was a question. Okay, the first question is, what if you give it to them spoiled? No, then it's too late. They already spoiled. You can be punished. All right, the other question, would I still violate the law of nature if I have too much of an object that cannot spoil? No, that's exactly the point about the introduction of money. If there's something I have a use for that can't spoil, I can keep as much of it as I want. For, oh, so the question was, for example, I have more money than I can ever spend in my lifetime. That's okay, you can give it to your heirs. So, um, okay, would it be better to destroy a possession rather than letting it spoil? And that was Vanessa's question. And Griffin says, according to Hobbes, yes, if you have a reason to destroy it. Right, yeah, so, I mean, um, if you just wantonly destroy it, that's pretty much the same or worse than just letting it spoil. But if you destroy it for a reason, like you eat it, you know, um, or I don't know, you use it to scare away spiders or something. Um, spiders are actually kind of good to have around, but never mind. Anyway, oh, then, uh, uh, yeah, that's much better than letting it spoil. That's using it. Using it doesn't necessarily mean eating it. It just means using it. Um, so, uh, um, right, so one of the exceptions 
to this law of nature is going to be stuff like gold and precious stones, which even before they start being used as money, people kind of want at least a little bit because they're pretty or whatever. Um, so uh, suppose I really like sparkly stones. Um, if I want to collect as many acorns as I want and trade them away to people for sparkly stones, there's no problem with that. I can have as many of those as I want because they'll never spoil. Now, um, there's a case that Locke unfortunately doesn't discuss, which is similar, which is Let's say I put my labor into making tools. So like um, I take rocks and I chip them to make great like acorn pounding tools. Those won't spoil. So I could accumulate a lot of them. And suppose other people need them. Well, I can use them to pay them to do stuff for me. Um, in that way, I could probably start to build up other kinds of property that I could use. Right? Like, now that they're doing stuff for me, I'm going to feed them, or, you know, something like that. Um, so, um, uh, now, I mean, in this kind of, like, caveman y slash North American Indian hunter gatherer or whatever state of nature. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not sure that's really true of any hunter gatherers, including North American Indian. But, uh, but you know, uh, anyway, in this kind of like caveman y state of nature, this is not going to be a um, maybe not going to be a major exception, like how many tools can you make, how many tools do you need, but it still seems like it might be an important oversight, like especially from Marx's point of view, you know, this is, those tools are the means of production, as Marx would say, right? So Locke is saying that there's no limit even in the state of nature, even before the invention of money, there's no limit to my right to accumulate the means of production. Um, okay, but the main exception that Locke, or it's not really an exception, that's what's important. It's not an exception, it's the exact same law. It just happens to be that we all get together and institute a use for something that never spoils. So this is not just a personal use that I find for it, like I think these pebbles are pretty. It's like a, a compact, although perhaps a tacit compact, right? We may not have literally gotten together and agreed to this, but we all start acting, coordinating our actions in such a way that um, um, we come to be guaranteed that's that you know a certain kind of sparkly stone or shell or piece of gold or whatever is going to be worth a certain amount of acorns right so i mean we have to all agree on that and, and so according to Locke, all money even like the gold standard or whatever um all money derives its worth from convention, its monetary worth. Um, we have to all agree that gold, let's say, is going to count as payment. And as soon as we agree on that, all of a sudden, um, it's not just a pretty thing that I might like collecting. It's something really, really useful because, you know, 10 years from now, maybe I won't have any acorns and I'll really want them. Well, that's why I have this gold saved up, right? Because I know I'll be able to find people who will give me acorns for the gold. Um, so, the, so the convention only changed things by changing, right? This says no more than I can use before it spoils. 
the, all the convention that introduced money did was to introduce a new use for, let's say, gold or silver or shells or whatever. But once that new use is, is introduced, now there's something that I can accumulate as much as I want of because, um, I mean, that's why we'll choose something like gold as to make our convention about. It's going to be something that is not too common, doesn't spoil, or doesn't spoil very quickly anyway, and um, probably is easily portable as well, right? We don't... Although I guess they say there's some Pacific Island or something where they use like huge stones as money. <laughs> I don't know. But in any case, uh, you're probably going to want it to be something that, you know, you can carry around with you. Um, but, you know, if it meets those criteria, it could be anything. Um, now, I mean... Um, this doesn't immediately give rise to inequality, right? I guess I should say before this happens, when everyone only gathers as much as they need, if you assume, so again, assuming that the original state of nature was a state of relative plenty, where everyone could get as much as they need, I mean, of course, some people are sick or old or whatever. Then they would have to depend on other people to help them. But at least for the most part, where everyone could get what they needed. So um, therefore, everyone would have about the same amount, namely the amount you need, right? Namely, the amount you can use before it will spoil. So, I mean, depending, if some people like nuts and other people like plums, the nuts people might have more nuts than the plums people have plums because plums spoil faster. But, you know, that's the way it goes. But there won't be huge inequality. Once this is introduced, there's a potential for huge inequality because now there's no limit to how much of I, I can lawfully keep. Um, and the law, again, will protect me. So, um, um, how does inequality get started, though? Well, Locke says, um, what time is it? No, I won't, because I didn't even get to paternal, I'm almost at paternal authority. All right, leave this. Um, this is chapter 5, section 48. Um, Hmm. I can't find it. All right, I'm just going to read it from my notes because I can't find it. Um, again, because I'm not using the edition where I had it underlined. Uh, all right, whatever. Um, he says, as different degrees of industry were apt to give men possessions in different proportions, so this invention of money gave them the opportunity to continue and enlarge them. Right? So in the state of nature, of course, it's not true that everyone had the same degree of industry. Um, I mean, whether this is like an innate characteristic or a matter of how you were brought up or um, what experiences you had or what other. Some people are going to work harder than others. Um, but in the original state of nature, although that was true, it didn't make much difference because, again, the thought is the original state of nature was a state where there was plenty of stuff and you didn't have to work all that hard to get as much as you needed. So the people who are extra industrious didn't really have any use for being extra, industri extra industrious. So it didn't make them richer than everyone else. But as soon as you invent this thing that you can accumulate as much as you want of, now the people who work harder have an incentive to work harder. Because, um, is MCM baby. I don't know what that is. All right. Um, because now the people who, who work harder, for whatever reason, have an incentive to work harder. Because, again, like, you know, 
suppose I've finished accumulating enough acorns for me to eat. It can't hurt for me to now try to get some gold. Right? Right? It's not... Oh, Marx's theory of capitalism. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, right, right. MCM, money, commodity. Yeah, okay. I remember that. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, Marx is going to say that this whole view of the state of nature is like um, um, a kind of fantasy based on what's really going on in Locke's real economic society. It took, yeah, someone says capitalism. Well, you know, I mean, this is not, ex this is not the st exactly the stage of development that, Locke, that Marx would call capitalism, right? I mean, it's not, this money is not factories. Um, oh, sorry, correcting this. Oh, okay, fine, right. But, but, it, but, it, but it is, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is like what Locke, what Marx would call the commodity stage. Um, by the way, I'm not such a big expert on Marx. I've said like almost like probably most of the things I know about Marx's economics already. No, I know a few more things, but in any case, uh, but um, um, this is definitely the place to think about, you know what Marx and Locke would disagree about, let's put it that way. So, um, um, right, so anyway, like, uh, it doesn't hurt for me to have more gold. I want more gold. So if I have some, like, um, industry left in me, I'm gonna, you know, go get some. Uh, and the other people, uh, you know, who are content with their acorns and don't have so much industry won't. So to begin with, this is going to be a small difference probably. Like maybe people, the difference in industry between different people is not that big. But obviously, once you start to accumulate money, um, um, you know, and pass it on to your heirs, you can, well, for example, use it to hire people to work for you. So you can amplify your ability to, you know, add their industry to your industry. Um, and uh, by a lot of mechanisms like that, that, that initial small difference, which like, I don't think, you don't have to assume that that is inherited, right? Like maybe the industrious person's heirs are not particularly industrious, but they start off with an advantage anyway. So, you know, so eventually that, that original small difference will start to, to get like amplified into potentially large inequalities. Um, I guess um, there's one other thing to say about this, which is that how this applies to, to land that is real property. Maybe I should say real property, that is land. So Locke says, well, it's exactly the same story. It's, you know, um, by mixing my labor with the land, it becomes mine. So if I plow and seed and all that stuff that you do, then the land becomes mine and someone else can't take it. Again, unless it's more than I can use. So like if I plow up a huge amount of land and plant it, but then a lot of it just rots and I never harvest it, Locke says, that part doesn't become mine. It's not clear that it's really exactly the same. I mean, for one thing, in that case, he doesn't say I violated a law of nature. Uh, he just says it's not mine. Maybe he still means I have violated a law of nature because the law kept other people out and they could have plowed it. But could they? I already, I don't know. Anyway, um, um, that's, I mean, I'm just flagging that for now because, you know, uh, property and land is going to turn out to be the most important kind. Um, somehow the fact that commonwealths have territory 
has to start with the fact that the people who formed them had, had property and land. You would think, anyway. That's what, right. That's why commonwealths are in a place rather than just among certain people. Um, I'm not sure if Hobbes actually has an explanation for that. I guess you could say, well, it's more convenient or something. But why, in principle, couldn't you just have a, like a mixture? Well, I guess from Hobbes' point of view, they'd be in a continual state of war. It wouldn't work out. But okay, well, whatever. Um, so now. There's some other questions I have about this, but I'm going to just go on to paternal authority unless there's more. Okay. Does this mean that Locke would oppose absentee landlords? Well, um, no, because again, after the invention of money, that becomes a use. Right? I can't harvest it myself, but someone's paying me for the right to harvest it. Now I have a use for it. So just as with all other possessions, the invention of money is going to, yeah, it's going to not only lead me to be able to accumulate more money, but it's going to lead me to accumulate all kinds of stuff because I can sell or rent it. Not more acorns, maybe, but more tools. I mean, more acorns, too, in the sense that I could become a merchant. I could have a warehouse house full of acorns. Um, as long as I'm confident that I can sell them before they spoil. Um, so land can be spoiled. Well, no, I mean, that's the, that's part of why it's somehow not exactly the same. The land doesn't get spoiled. It's the crops that could spoil. But the point is, if I'm a, if I'm a landlord, which you know that the word farmer originally meant renter, right? Like all farms were owned by landlords, <laughs> essentially. Right? So, um, yeah. So, like, if I'm if I'm a landlord, um, so I have this huge amount of property that I could never harvest myself, or use the the use the harvest of myself but all the tenants pay me and I can keep the, all that gold, that won't spoil. So that's fine. Before the invention of money, there would have been no way or no easy way to do that. Maybe they could have given me tools or something. All right. I'm sorry, but I, okay, I do want to get onto paternal authority. I've put it off too long. Uh, Maybe I'll t no. I can't, can I talk about it next time? I don't know. I've got to introduce the civil, the beginning of political society next time. Um, okay. I guess. Well. Okay. So here are the main points. First of all, um, let me erase all of this. Um, Locke begins by making the point that although it's called paternal authority, that's really a mistake. It should be called parental authority. Because it's just in mu as much in the mother as in the father. And um, this, again, is not a point against Hobbes, because we saw Hobbes say the exact same thing. Um, it's a point against Filmer, right? I mean, if Filmer wants to build all political authority on Adam's authority as a father, well, uh, Adam shared that authority with Eve. So that, there's no basis for absolute monarchy there. Um, um, However, when you get into the details, he doesn't agree with Hobbes about exactly what this authority that the mother and father share is or where it comes from. So Locke says that there's three sources of it. So the first one is, I'm going to call it guardianship. I don't think Locke uses that term. Maybe he uses that term here and there, but uh, he doesn't use it as official heading anyway. 
the first source of paternal power is, um, as Locke says, a sort of rule and jurisdiction that parents have over children as long as the children don't have the use of their own reason. Don't have, I guess you would have to say, the full use of their own reason. Um, um, and that rule and jurisdiction, Locke says, is really a privilege of the children, not of the parents. It derives from the parents' duty to take care of the children until they can take care of themselves. So, um, so, like, first of all, where the duty comes, to take, comes from to take care of children until they can take care of themselves, again, that seems to be based on, like, observation of human biology or something. I mean, again, you can bring, bring biblical authority for it, but the question is, how are people in the wilds of North America supposed to have known about it? But the law of nature applies to them too, right? So it must be a law of reason. Um, but in any case, if you, if you grant that, that the parents have a duty to care for their children until the children can take care for themselves, then, well, of course, there's many ways that human children are not able to care for themselves. When they're first born, they're not even able to hold their heads up. I certainly remember that hair-raising phase. And, uh, you know, eventually they're able to do more and more things, but they need a lot of help. So this duty involves all kinds of stuff. But, um, and in part of I think this, uh, the, the, the jurisdiction or rule that's based on this duty is based on the fact that the parents have to protect the children by telling them what to do, right? So like if the parent says, stay out of the road, the they have to, you know, um, have the authority to make the child stay out of the road with punishments if necessary, because otherwise the child could be run over by a car. Um, but I think that's only, that's not actually the main point here. The main point is this, as long as the children don't have enough use of their reason that they can be, that other people can expect them to obey the law of nature, they need someone to guarantee that they will obey the law of nature to protect them. Right, because the law of nature only protects, and this is like the same point that I was making at the end last time, the law of nature only protects people who can be expected to keep it. The, the, the reason my self-preservation involves like enforcing the law of nature um, on behalf of other people is because other people can be expected to punish me if I, if I don't, right? So, like, um, um, if we're talking about people who are going to punish me one way or another, then there is no uh, interest of self-preservation in respecting their rights. So in order to protect the, the child from human society, the parents have to guarantee that the child will obey the law of nature. That's, part, that's the main source of their authority in this area. And therefore, Locke says, number one, of course this doesn't extend to making capital punishments or anything like that. It's solely for the children's protection. It can't have anything to do with possibly causing them permanent harm. Um, and it ends the instant the child has the use of reason enough to be expected to obey the law of nature. If they never do, right, that is if they're a change thing or uh, whatever you want to call it, then they always will have to have guardians. Um, Okay, I'm basically out of time. I'm just going to write down what the two other sources are. So the second source is gratitude. 
this is the duty, this is a, a privilege of the parents, not of the children. It is a duty of the children, given all the things the parents have done for them, to honor and protect their parents for the rest of their lives, Locke says. But, Locke says, this isn't ty any type of jurisdiction or dominion at all. It doesn't give it, the parents the slightest right to issue commands. It just means the, um, the children have a duty to do what they think is in the parents', parents best interest. And that's why he says, like, even if you're a king and your mother, like the queen mother, is not a ruling queen, so she's your subject, that doesn't free you from this duty. This has nothing to do with dominion. And the third thing he mentions is inheritance. And this is the power that, at this point he says only the father, but of course it doesn't have to be the father. In any case, it's the power that the parents get because normally the children expect the, their parents' possessions to be passed on to them when the parents die. So the parents can say, at least implicitly, do what I want or else you won't get the inheritance. So Locke says that's no little power, but of course it's not something they get by means of generation. Anyone who you rely on for gifts would have that kind of power over you. Um, it just happens that it's more often the parents. Okay, uh, there's a lot more to say, obviously, but I'm already two minutes over, so I will not say it, and I'll see you on Thursday. Bye.